And uh, we have a special speaker today. It's Ben's dad, Steve Wamberg. And so we're, uh, I'm looking forward to getting a word from him. You know, I don't just invite anybody to this pulpit. Do you know that? Do you, you do understand that I check references, not just the sun, but I check references before I invite someone. So we have a mutual friend in Mike Hutchins who is the head of the Supernatural School of Ministry for Global Awakening. Mike and Steve went to seminary together. You shared one another's weddings, is that right? And they've been good friends all these years. And so uh, he, I called Mike. Mike gave him a great reference. And so I felt comfortable inviting him here. And I also want you to know, if someone is in this pulpit and they say something that is theologically incorrect, if it's really blatant, I, would, I might correct them at that moment. If, it was, if they said something outlandish like, Jesus is not Lord. But if they say something that I believe is theologically incorrect, I will let you know. I will follow up with that, and I will make sure that things that are said from this pulpit are theologically sound. Are you, do you know that? Okay, all right. So with great confidence, I invite Steve to come forward and share what God has put on his heart this morning. You can't go wrong with an introduction like that, can you? I cannot. Oh, amen. I'm so Thanks. glad to have you here this morning. Um, and now he traveled as a, as a singing evangelist, is that right? Yeah. And also with Compassion Ministries, where if you've gone to these large concerts and they ask you to adopt a child, that's a, that was who he would work that's for nice. with those large concerts. So we... Just invite you to share your heart, and uh, we open our hearts and receive. Amen. So give him a great big radiant Amen. welcome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good morning. Good morning. I almost feel like saying the prayer and sitting down. I, that was, that was awfully, awfully kind of you. And it was awfully kind of you to check Hutch for a for a reference because there are others you could probably check who would say who? No. <laughs> uh, this morning I just want to get right, cut right to the chase. I see the clock. That's good. You know what happens? You know, uh, sometimes you, you would see evangelists take off their watch and, and put it on the stand in front of them. You know what that means? Absolutely nothing. Just thought I'd let you know. Don't be taken in. This morning, um, when, uh, when Pastor Connie uh, called and we were discussing what uh, I might speak about this morning, uh, she said, let Holy Spirit lead you. And immediately a passage came to mind. And then as I studied and I worked through it, the topic came to mind and then the fill in the blanks occurred and I just want to let you know flat out that this morning's message is on forgiveness please understand where we're headed with this because there are there are times and there's right emphasis in making sure that we forgive others all right and and don't want to make light of that in any way but I want to make sure this morning that you understand clearly that God forgives you. Because if you do not begin from that point of knowing that God has forgiven you, you're going to have a very difficult time forgiving others. If the church could learn any one thing from the next 20 minutes or so, I would encourage you all did that sound Southern? Thank you very much. I would encourage you all to, to think about the difference between what is being called forgiveness today in a cancel culture and what is biblical forgiveness. And the reason that is important is because there's a difference between being forgiven uh, out of an attitude of, of revenge 
I mean, that seems contradictory from the outset, doesn't it? I, I want to get even with you, therefore I forgive you. Anyone else have an issue with that? Biblical forgiveness, the forgiveness that comes from God is restorative. Get that? Restorative. Restorative. And, and, and you, you, you allow God to pick you up and you allow God to forgive you and you understand that you have been forgiven and therefore the grace is more than enough. That's a very important word. The grace is more than enough to allow you to forgive others. But, but it, there, there's, there's this thing about forgiving ourselves that we may have issue with. And so let's dive right into the scriptures there, if you will. And if you have a Bible, please turn to the 18th chapter of Matthew. That's Matthew 18. It's page 868 in my Bible. I know that may not help you much. Matthew 18, and go on down to uh, verse 21. This is a very familiar uh, parable, I think, to, to most of us, certainly if we've been around the church for a while. I'm reading from the New International Version, and there are many good versions around. I would simply encourage you to read one of them regularly. Ready? Matthew 18 and 21 and following. Catch this. The context is a, is, a, is a great, memorable. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Ooh. Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times, and Peter, who was keeping it tallied in notches on his belt, figured he better get a larger belt, right? Therefore, and here's the parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents, that's a lot, that's a chunk of change. You know, that's, uh, in, in, some interpreters say it may represent millions of dollars um, in, in today's currency. I couldn't tell you, okay? But it's a lot, a, a, a whole bunch. That's what they taught me in Greek. Can you believe it? No, no. What does it mean? A whole bunch. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he, he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him and said, be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. If the 10,000 talents equaled like 43 million bucks, the 100 denarii was like a happy meal, okay? We're talking like five bucks. Not a big deal. He grabbed him and began to choke him in kingdom love. Right? Hey. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, and I'll pay you back, but he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. 
This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Okay, I want you to see this, though, this morning. What if, what if, what if the servant who had been forgiven 10,000 talents could not extend forgiveness to his servant buddy because the servant who had been forgiven so much didn't believe he was really forgiven. You see, because after years and years of observation, I've noticed that people who have problems forgiving others really have issues in believing God has forgiven them first. Can we start there? The difficulty in extending forgiveness may be that we do not believe that God has forgiven us first. The unmerciful servant, why would you need five bucks when you've been forgiven 10,000 talents? Three words, just in case. Just in case my debt wasn't really canceled. I may need those five bucks. Just in case. I'm going to grab onto what's mine. just in case I need it. Here is where this comes in. Believe and receive. Do you know what happened when, when they were beginning to put together historical creeds, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, etc., etc., etc.? Latin had developed enough as a language, just enough, that believe had this little added element to it linguistically where it was something that became a part of a person. If you say you believed in something, okay, that meant more than an intellectual agreement. If you believed in something, it was like saying, I trust this enough to walk in it. I trust this enough to walk in it. And if the master tells me I am forgiven, if the king tells me I am forgiven, then guess what? Yeah. And I know sometimes when you, when you get up in the morning, if you're like me, you look in the mirror, you see the damage that was done overnight. Huh? And you take an assessment and you figure out, you know, God, I don't know what you can do with me today, but here I am. I'm a lot more submissive than I was when I was 22. You can be happy about that. So the first point if you're taking down points. I'm sorry, I only rhyme things for Baptists. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. No. <laughs> Bottom line is, is it, it principle of the universe about forgiveness. No one needs forgiveness more than I. No one needs forgiveness more than I do. Okay? I need forgiveness. Therefore, I've got to go to the mat with this issue of belief, believing I was forgiven, with the intended outcome 
that I'm going to be able to forgive others. But in order to do that, I've got to believe that God has forgiven me. I've got to agree with God about his forgiveness for me and move forward from there. If we don't have that as a very fundamental position, forgiveness will not make much sense to us, and therefore we will not be able to apply it to our own lives. All right? Point one, if you needed a point. I want, to, I want you to take a look with me real quickly. We'll stay in the Gospels. Go to a familiar passage again. Luke chapter 15, uh, and go down to verse 11. A very familiar story. It's the story of the, of the two prodigal sons. And the loving father. Luke 15, 11 and following. Familiar story, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Folks, I've got to let you know, in traditional Judaism, that's an issue. You know, pigs were unclean animals. So Jesus is telling this story and putting together a case, you know, where he's saying this kid would have been counted out, all right? There may not have been, felt like there was much left to forgive. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, did you ever do anything where you had to rehearse a speech to think about getting back in someone's good graces? This is what I'm going to say. Does that sound good? Go in front of the mirror and say it again. Does that sound better? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Take note of that. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, catch this father's heart, please. His father saw him and was filled with compassion. And that word in Greek says he was overcome with a feeling that took his breath away. He was overcome with compassion. He was overcome with wanting to come alongside his kid. You know, maybe you can imagine it this way, that, that you're at the edge of a ranch or a farm, and there's this pathway down the middle of the farm that takes you from the mailbox all the way up to the front porch. And I can see this dad going back and forth with his second or third cup of coffee because he's doing his morning devotions. And while he's doing his devotions, he's thinking about his son. Why that? Because he always does. All right? Because his kid matters. You need to believe that about yourself. Okay? And, and, and why do I matter? Is it because I'm so wonderful? No, it's because God calls me his own. Why does anyone else around you matter? You know? And at the bottom line, they can have a lot of wonderful attributes and a lot of good talents and skills that God has intertwined into their lives, and, and that's wonderful, and it's something to celebrate. Yes, yes, and yes. What 
gives me value. I am created in God's image. I am a child of God. See, and, 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 and that's where forgiving yourself matters. Because when we don't forgive ourselves, we devalue the creation that God has built us to be. Watch this. The father runs to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And the kid starts his speech. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer to be worthy to, call, to be called your son. And then you notice that the father somehow stops him. I don't need to hear any more from you, son. The father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. You got that? That is an example of restorative forgiveness. All right? And perhaps the ultimate example, save the very real fact of Jesus going to the cross, you know, that probably illustrates restorative forgiveness. Why? Because the Father is welcoming him back into the family. You know, it isn't, it isn't an issue of staying off on the fringes. And see, friends, so many of us rob the church of what we are called to do because we feel unworthy because we say we are not worth it. I remember years ago, yeah, it was years ago, when I was dating Ben's mother. Uh, she was in a singing group I had been in years before. And uh, I was a graduate student in Chicago, and they were over playing a date uh, just off the lake in Chicago. And uh, we were in this hall that was a union hall, which meant that union people had to help us haul equipment in and out. And I was hanging around watching the equipment for the band because I thought maybe I could catch, you know, 15, 20 minutes with Annie just as for being nice. I mean, come on. Uh, and obviously it worked out. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, there was a guy who walked in, and, he, and I remember to this day he had on a uh, driver's cap big hulk of a guy, kind of built, kind of built like a linebacker. Uh, and he introduced himself and he, and he said, my name is Doc. I'm here uh, to represent the union. I am doing the lighting tonight and I can do everything but the second spotlight. Do you know anything about theater? Yep. You know anything about spotlights? Yep. Would you run the second tonight? We'll sign you on as an apprentice. Cool. So, um, Doc and I talked all afternoon while he was setting stuff up, and uh, I finally asked him, you know, well, Doc, what do you, you know, this this is a Christian group, but what do you what do you think? I mean, is that going to be kind of tough for you to sit through this tonight? He said, Christians, huh? I was a Christian once. But not anymore. See, God can't use me. I've seen too much. I've done too much. I, I, I don't think he's taking a look at me anymore. And we kept going through the afternoon's activities and evening came and it was time to start the concert and um, and Doc piece by piece, song by song began to be reminded of the gospel again and about the third song in he said, hey Steve over, over, the, over the headset okay while we're running lights for this thing 
Steve, what, isn't there a verse somewhere that says something about the devil being like a roaring lion? And I said, yeah. And we talked about that for a while. And Doc would bring up other things that he remembered from Sunday school as a kid. And I thought things were going great. And the evangelist did the ser sermon and very clear presentation of the gospel. I thought things were going to go well. You know, and I finally, at the end of it, met Doc uh, Center Balcony and said, Doc, what did you think about tonight? I mean, you know, we had a lot of discussion. It sounds to me like maybe um, you're ready to, to let Jesus, you know, do some stuff in your life again. And he said, no. I've seen too much. I've done too much. I'm just junk. And he turned on his heel and he walked away from me. And I yelled out after him once. And I just said, Doc, you don't need to walk away. Jesus didn't die for junk. You're not junk. And he stopped just, just for a few seconds. And then he kept going. I don't want you walking off. I don't want you going in the other direction. I want you to know that the depth of God's forgiveness for you, the love of God, because God dictates the terms of his contract. You know, the kid in the prodigal story, son, had a speech ready to rock. He'd probably rehearse that thing for a few miles. And he starts that speech, and the father in the story says, No more. You're restored. You're forgiven. And the older son doesn't understand forgiveness yet. And he sure doesn't understand forgiveness as restoration. He understands forgiveness in retribution. And sometimes people around us act that way. And I apologize on their behalf. But don't let that, please, do not let that stop you from appropriating God's forgiveness for you fully. Is this making sense? Okay. I can wrap this up in seven minutes. Ready? But you got to go back to the Old Testament. So I'm going to give you a little extra time. To 2 Samuel chapter 14. No one needs forgiveness more than I. God dictates the terms of forgiveness, the terms of the contract. You can say a lot of stuff to God, and he will listen. He may not agree with you, but he will listen. But one of the things you dare not try to dictate to God, see, because this prodigal kept himself out on the fringe. Do you notice that phrase? You know, and I'm having you turn to 2 Samuel 14. You can look at it later. You know that phrase, make me like one of the hired men? I can't be family anymore, can I? I'm no longer worthy to be called a family member. Make me like one of the hired men. And do you think that satisfies a father's heart? Really? God dictates the terms of forgiveness, and that, th those terms are not filled with retribution. They're filled with restoration. And that's part of what we need to get out of the story of the prodigal. Now, this passage out of 2 Samuel 14, we're just going to go through the first 14 verses and get to the punchline. Uh, Absalom, David's son, has killed Amnon uh, for a situation that many would have forgiven. 
Um, and, and we begin with Joab trying to make something happen so David and Absalom will reconcile. And that's where this comes in, okay? Because we're kind of hopping into the middle of the book. Joab, son of Zer Zeruiah, knew that the king's heart longed for Absalom. Father's heart, watch it. So Joab sent someone to Tekoa and had a wise woman brought from there. He said to her, pretend you are in mourning. This is Joab prepping this lady. Dress in mourning clothes. Don't use any cosmetic lotions. Act like a woman who has spent many days grieving for the dead. Then go to the king and speak these words to him. And Joab put the words in her mouth. There are a lot of nuances going on in this story. You know, one is that a wise woman had sort of a special place in the context of Tekoa. And although it's not always necessarily interpreted as a, as a biblical office, the idea was is that this is a woman who knew how to put an argument together. In other ancient Near Eastern cultures, every once in a while it would refer to a woman who, who was learned. I don't know, okay? But she was good enough at what she did to get Joab's attention. When the woman from Tekoa went to the king, she fell with her face to the ground to pay him honor, and she said, help me, O king. Watch this. The king asked her, what is troubling you? This is David. She said, I am indeed a widow. My husband is dead. I, your servant, had two sons. They got into a fight with each other in the field, and no one was there to separate them. One struck the other and killed him. Now the whole clan has risen up against your servant. They say, hand over the one who struck his brother down, so that we may put him to death for the life of the brother who he killed. Then we will get rid of the heir as well. They would put out the only burning coal I have left, leaving my husband neither name nor descendant on the face of the earth. The king said to the woman, go home, and I will issue an order in your behalf. But the woman from Tekoa said to him, my lord the king, let the blame rest on me and on my father's family, and let the king and his throne be without guilt. The king replied, if anyone says anything to you, bring him to me, and he will not bother you again. She said, now do you notice what's happening here? She's bringing David into a story that she is weaving that describes his situation. All right? She's creating a story that brings David into a place where as he makes a decision on the person in the story, he is actually making a decision about himself. She said, then let the king invoke the Lord, verse 11, his God, to prevent the avenger of blood from adding to the destruction, so that my son will not be destroyed. As surely as the Lord lives, he said, not one hair of your son's head will fall to the ground. Then the woman said, let your servant speak a word to my lord the king. Speak, he replied. Okay. Just a reminder as we go into the next two verses. Who is the story actually about? David. Okay? Then that makes sense of these next couple of verses. The woman said, then why have you devised a thing like this against the people of God? In other words, why are you going to rob Israel of another person in the royal family. When the king says this, does he not convict himself? For the king has not brought back his banished son. Remember, Absalom was banished for killing his brother Amnon. Amnon. That's a tough one for me to say. Amnon, the M and the N go together. 
Like water spilled on the ground, I love this verse. Like water spilled on the ground which cannot be recovered, so we must die. But God does not take away life. Instead, watch this. Instead, he devises ways so that a banished person may not remain estranged from him. Once we were no people. Now we are the people of God. Once there was no redemption. Now we have found redemption because redemption found us in the person of Jesus Christ. Once, once, we were a people trapped in the cage of our own unforgiveness. Now, <clears throat> we are people of the promise because we see the great value God has given us through his investment of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. We see, we see the, the breadth and depth of his riches that he has poured out on the church in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> What more? What more? What more? It is one thing to say God is not far from me, and that is true, and that is crucial. But if you add to that, the creator of the universe is devising ways to bring me home. Is that okay with you? Because here's how it goes real quickly. And then I'll be, I'll be done for a while. <laughs> we cannot wander far. You know, when some, uh, some geographic scholars put that faraway land that was talked about in the story of the prodigal, that faraway land from where Jesus likely taught, that faraway land was just a city that was visible across the lake. Why was it far away? Was it the mileage? No. It was far away because it removed itself from God's heart. It removed itself from God's care. I'm going to ask you this morning, by way of invitation, you know, if you will, quietly, if you like, with sound, if you like. Now let's pray together. Holy Spirit, we invite you to invade our hearts. We invite you to invade our thoughts. We invite you to invade this place. And we invite you, Lord God, to remind us how much we are forgiven. We ask you, God, to remind us how valuable we are to you. And we do not want to play the prodigal a moment longer than we have already. In your heart, in the quiet of your thoughts, Cut the deal with God. 
in the power of the Holy Spirit that says no more. I will not run. No more. I will not hide behind religion. I will not hide behind my status, my income, or lack thereof. I am yours, and I flat out need you. In a few moments, we're going to approach the Lord's table. And it will be an opportunity to celebrate you coming home. And here I may not be talking about salvation. There are people who have struggled with years of not really receiving God's forgiveness in everyday life and power. And I'm here simply to say on the authority of the gospel, the church needs you. Jesus empowered you for a day like this. The culture is seeing enough of retributive forgiveness. They need to see redemption. They need to see restoration. And it needs to begin with us. And if that is your prayer right now, take God up on his gracious offer. stay in this attitude of prayer as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. If the ushers would come forward.